Welcome to our Surviving Market Swing Seminar. We're glad that you could join us today. We are here at Confidence Wealth, are committed to helping you evaluate your financial situation and also want to give you tools to help you make informed decisions and also pursue your financial goals as well. Please note that the information in this presentation is not written or intended as tax, legal, investment, or retirement advice, or recommendation as well. And it may not be relied on for the purpose of avoiding any federal tax penalties. One more thing, this presentation is not based off of your unique individual circumstances. So let's get started. We all know a global pandemic, May 2020, a particularly difficult year, both financial and emotional for many. Even so, the S&P 500 price index gained 16% in 2020, which is a surprising performance, often credited to the speedy development of vaccines and massive economic stimulus, which was provided by the Federal Reserve and Congress. So while the S&P 500 is generally considered representative of the U.S. stock market, this recovery was actually powered by technology giants that thrived on the stay-at-home economy. If you look back in August 9th, 2020, the big six tech companies, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Microsoft, and Alphabet as well, which is, by the way, Google's parent, represented more than one-fourth of the market value of the S&P 500 which gave them outsized effect on index performance. Of course, there is no way to know what the defining moment of 2021 will be, but you can count on market swings to challenge your patience as an investor. Political uncertainty, international conflicts, interest rate decisions, and economic shifts here and abroad can actually spur volatility in the financial market. And it's generally a case of when and not if it happens. So it's only natural to be concerned when the market drops, but expecting volatility and having a sound financial strategy in place may be the best defense you could have when events roll the markets. This might also help prevent you from making emotion-based investment decisions. You see, your plans for the future shouldn't have to depend on daily fluctuations in the, in the stock market. Basically, gains and losses are part of investing. But by using deliberate, time-tested approaches, you may be able to pursue your goals without feeling as though you need to consistently adjust your portfolio to react to today's news. You see, the performance of an unmanaged index is not indicative of the performance of any specific investment. And as an individual, you cannot invest directly in an index. Past performance, of course, is no guarantee of any future results, and actual results may vary. So let's consider how events have influenced the performance of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which basically tracks the prices of 30 of the largest U.S. companies from 2007 through 2020. The graph you see up there starts just before the financial crisis that led to the Great Recession. Dow stocks fell more than 50% between October 2007 and March 2009, yet there is yet recovered much of their losses during the last three quarters of 2009. So stocks continue to climb over the next decade, but not without enduring bouts of volatility. And the Dow last crossed the 10,000 mark in August 2010 and surpassed 20,000 in January 2017. So in 2017, the Dow posted 70 record closings. It's a feat that also set a record and approached the 25,000 mark. The anticipation of tax cuts overcame three interest rate hikes by the Federal Reserve, and that's in 2018. And the Dow crossed 26,000 for the first time, but fell sharply in the fourth quarter, and it closed out the year just above 23,000. Four interest rate hikes, political strife, and a trade dispute with China made it the worst year for the stocks since the financial crisis. Now let's go 2019. The Dow dropped more than 6% in the month of May mostly due to escalating trade tensions. And in August 14 of that year, the Dow plunged 3% when a yield curve inversion triggered recession worries. After that, the Dow recovered quickly and kept climbing, sending the year above 28,000. Now let's go to 2020, where the threat of COVID-19 and a sudden economic recession sent financial markets into a tailspin, and the Dow dropped below 19,000 on March 18th, and then bounced back quickly to end the year at at an all-time high above 30,000. As you can see, 
the market swing that accompanied the past two recessions, which is 2008 to 2009 and 2020, would demonstrate why overreacting in fear can result in even greater losses. Investors who panicked and sold stocks when prices were falling may not have been positioned to participate fully in the market recovery. So realizing that the markets are historically cyclical may help you stay calm in the face of market volatility. Do you know the difference between a market pullback, a market correction, a bear market, and a bull market? A pullback is typically defined as a 5% to 10% dip in market index, like the Dow Jones or the S&P 500 index, from a recent uh, high. When the market loses 10% to 20% below its 52-week high, it's considered to be market correction. And a bear market is typically defined as a decline of 20% or more from the most recent high. And a bull market is an increase of 20% or more from a bear market low. Beginning on February 19, 2020, worries about the spread of COVID-19 send U.S. stocks into a bear market for the first time in nearly 11 years. And the S&P 500 index dropped nearly 34% in February and March before it rebounded to a new high by the end of the year. A simple explanation for the disconnect between the buoyant stock prices and the economy that continue to struggle is that the stock market is forward-looking. See, investors believed that the pandemic would be controlled in the not-too-distant future and business activity would return to normal. And that's what happened here. Remarkably, a new bull market began on March 23rd, 2020, when the index closed at its official low point. The 2020 bear market was the shortest in record, lasting just 33 days. There have been 11 bear markets since 1950. On average, bull markets lasted longer by 1955 days than bear markets, which are 395 days over this period. And the average bull market advance, 172%, was greater than the average bear market decline, which is 34.2%. The takeaway is that neither the ups or the downs last forever, even if they feel as though they will. So when developing your financial strategy, it is important to consider how overall economic conditions might affect your investment portfolio now and in the future. You should position yourself financially for a range of possibilities, taking into account the factors that may influence the economy and financial markets, many of which are listed here. On June 8, 2020, the National Bureau of Economic Research, which has the official responsibility of determining U.S. business cycles, announced that February 2020 marked the beginning of a recession. By the way, this is not a surprise considering the severe disruption in business activity due to COVID-19 and the immediate spike in unemployment. One common definition of a recession is two more quarters of negative growth gross domestic product, which is the GDP. The value of all goods and services produced across the economy contracted at an annual rate of 5% in the first quarter of 2020. And that's before shrinking by a historic 31.4% in the second quarter. Now, GDP bounced back 33.4% in the third quarter and expanded 4.1% in the fourth quarter. But overall, the U.S. economy shrunk 3.5% in 2020 from 2019 annual level. You see, about 22 million jobs were lost in the first month of the pandemic in April 2020. The unemployment rate spiked to 14.7%. That's the highest official rate on record. Just two months earlier, it was 3.5%. A 50-year low. By December 2020, the headline unemployment rate had improved to 6.7%, but more than 9 million jobs had yet to be recovered. You see, the economic turmoil caused by COVID-19 prompted the Federal Reserve to slash the federal funds rate from a range of 1.5% to 1.75% to a range of 0 to 0.25%. That's in March 2020, where it stayed like that through December. And the Fed also implemented a new policy of virtually unlimited bond buying and launched an emergency facilities so that would help stabilize the financial markets. The federal government also passed one stimulus package in March 2020, another in December, which together, I think they provided more than $3 trillion in economic relief for hard-hit households and businesses, among other things. Now, on a positive note, the housing market got unexpected boost from the COVID-19 pandemic, because buyers took advantage of low mortgage rates and as the shift in remote work. 
So more spacious homes in suburbs or away from major cities offer less expensive and or more comfortable places to ride out the pandemic. You see the national median price of an existing home ended 2020 at $340,000, which is an increase of 13.4% over previous December. So what might we look forward in 2021? According to economic projections from the Federal Reserve, the path of economy will depend significantly on the course of the virus. The ongoing public health crisis will continue to weigh on the economic activity, unemployment, and inflation in the near term, and poses considerable risk to the economic outlook over the medium term. The projection of gross domestic product growth ranged widely from 3.7% to 5%. The same goes for the unemployment rate with estimates spanning 4.7 to 5.4%. The forecast for inflation is 1.7 to 1.9%, which is still below the Fed's target rate. The Federal Reserve, though, has pledged to keep the federal fund rate near zero until the labor market reaches maximum employment and inflation is on track to moderately exceed 2% at the same time. As a result, interest rate hikes are not expected until 2023 or later. Also, approved vaccines should help normalize everyday life, though it could take a while for the economy to regain its full strength. More than 90% of economists surveyed by the Wall Street Journal, by the way, believe that hiring would accelerate in the second quarter of 2021, aided by the distribution of vaccines. Now, these economic projections are essentially educated guesses based on the data that was available towards the end of 2020. Nearly all economic forecasts for 2020 became irrelevant in a heartbeat, and the outlook for 2021 is murkier than usual. The economy could still bounce back sooner or later than projected, and some industries actually may struggle more than others. As always, different series of unseen events could test the economy and investors in 2021. So today, we'll discuss the four topics that may help you cope with market fluctuations as you pursue your goals. First, we'll look at how developing a sound financial strategy can create a solid foundation for your investment portfolio. Next, we'll identify a number of investment vehicles and explain the role they might play in your portfolio. Then we will discuss fundamental investment tactics that could help protect a portfolio over time. And finally, we'll look at a few ideas for pulling it all together. You see, developing sound financial strategy may help keep you from being stampeded into making poor investment decisions, especially during uncertain times. There are three main considerations to bear in mind when developing a sound strategy. You need to have a clear understanding of your investment and objectives. You need to know your investment time frame, and you need to understand your risk tolerance. So let's look at each of these considerations in a bit more detail. The first step of developing a sound financial strategy is to establish your investment objective. For example, what are you trying to achieve by investing? Are you working towards comfortable retirement? Are you trying to get, say, for college education for a family member? Do you want a cabin in the mountains? Do you want a trip around the world? Your personal financial goal will basically help determine the appropriate mix of assets for your investment portfolio, depending on which objective you're pursuing, such as preservation of principal, income, growth, and or tax benefits. The second element in developing a sound financial strategy is your time frame. You see, the amount of time you have before you need to accomplish your goal can have tremendous impact on the investment categories you choose. That's because fluctuations in the financial markets can actually affect the short-term value of certain types of investments. If, for example, your goal is saving for a down payment on a house in the next year or two, your goal is a specific amount of money and your time frame is very short. Therefore, you wouldn't want to invest all your money in aggressive investments that carry a lot of risk. You simply wouldn't have time to recover from heavy losses if they occurred. Now, retirees are especially vulnerable to market volatility. Think about what could happen if a bear market or a market downturn occurred during the early year of your retirement and you had a high percentage of your portfolio in stocks. That could be a disaster. Now, the third element in developing a sound financial strategy is your risk tolerance. You see, determining your risk tolerance means evaluating how much risk you're willing to take in pursuit of your financial goals, including the ability to watch the value of your investment fluctuate without becoming queasy. Generally, the more potential for growth offered by an investment, the more risk it carries. You see, volatility in the markets have tested many investors' risk tolerance and driven home the fact that risk is an essential consideration of a sound investment strategy. 
So how much risk can you stand? We develop a risk tolerance quiz to help you assess your own ability to stand risk. There should be a link to download this quiz somewhere in this page. Investing always involves risk. Here are some of the most common types. Economic risk. It can affect some securities. For example, when the economy falters or global growth slows down, corporate earnings can suffer. Though some industries, by the way, and companies may adjust very well to downturns in the economy. Others, particularly industrial firms, could take longer to recover. Another one would be market risk. Effects of most type of investment stocks as well as bonds when the market declines sharply, it tends to pull down the value of most individual securities with it. After a decline, the affected securities may recover at rates more closely related to their fundamental strength. A long-term investing strategy may help reduce the effect of market risk. Another type of risk called specific risk might affect only certain companies or industries, for example, management decisions, product quality, and consumer trends can affect company earnings and stock values. Diversifying your investments could help manage specific risks such as these. Bonds and other fixed income investments tend to be sensitive to changes in interest rates. So when interest rates rise, the value of these investments falls and vice versa. We'll discuss this some more in detail later in this presentation. Bond deals are closely tied to their perceived credit risk, which is the possibility that the borrower will default, i.e. fail to make payment on any type of debt. Default obviously can result in losses of principal and interest disruption of a cash flow and collection costs, of course, can become a factor. And finally, there's inflation. The increase in the prices of goods and services over time. Inflation basically poses a threat because it can reduce your future purchasing power. For example, overly cautious investors who place their investments in traditional savings account may not earn enough to outpace inflation. And when you evaluate their return on an investment, it's always wise to consider the real rate of return, which adjusts for inflation. In a very real sense, inflation is the loss of purchasing power. So regardless of how quickly your investments are growing, they're always losing ground to inflation. Here are four common items and what they might cost in 20 years, assuming a 3% annual inflation rate. Now that you're aware of these three components of the sound financial strategy, let's take a look at some of the common types of investments and the role they might play in your portfolio. When it comes to choosing a sound investment vehicle, most people think of three types of investments, stocks, bonds, and cash alternatives. We will spend some time talking about each of these vehicles individually. We will also discuss mutual funds and exchange-traded funds, which are portfolio securities assembled by investment company, and annuities, which are insurance-based products. Let's talk about stocks. Stocks represent shares of ownership in a corporation. When you buy a stock, you participate in the company's assets and earnings. Since stocks can lose money, why should you continue investing in them? Well, compared with other types of investments, stocks overall have had a strong performance record over the long period of time, providing an 11.5% average annual return over the last 40 years. Although stocks tend to be volatile, investors have been able to lower their exposure to the market risk on a historical basis by investing over the long term. For example, based on historical performance of the stock market, over the past 40 years, the chance of losing money in stocks over a one-year time period was 17.5%. After five years, the odds of experiencing a loss declined to 13.9%. And after 10 years, the chance of loss fell to 6.5%. Remember that past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Now remember, investors who keep investment fundamentals in mind may be able to build portfolios that help them smooth out the market normal ups and downs. The percentage, the price earning ratio is a simple mathematical calculation which you divide the price per share of a stock by the company's annual earnings per share. The result tells you the price you're paying for each dollar in earnings for that stock. For example, assume you own a hypothetical stock that costs $20 per share and the underlying company has annual earning of $2 per share. In this case, the stock price per share, $20 divided by the annual earnings per share, $2, equals 10. And therefore, the stock has a PE ratio of 10. You pay $10 in a share price for every $1 annual earning. A high PE ratio is generally considered to reflect market optimism about a company's future. 
but it shouldn't be taken literally as a basis for an investment. Different sectors of the economy often reflect significantly different PE ratios. Of course, value isn't the only consideration when examining stock investments. You might also estimate how volatile the stock is likely to be using its beta. The beta is usually expressed in a number such as 1, 1.25, or 0.85. This number is a statistical measure of the relationship between a stock expected return and expected return of a broad stock market index, such as the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The beta is a correlation with the movement of the market as a whole. So when calculating a stock beta, analysts use a formula that sets one as the base for the market. And if a stock beta is one, the the stock will tend to move with the market. When the market rises 10%, the stock can be expected to rise 10%. That's on average. If a stock beta is 1.5, it'll typically tend to be more volatile than the market. So for example, the market drops to 10%, the stock can be expected to drop 15%. So a common misconception is that bonds are appropriate only for conservative investors. However, because bonds are generally less volatile than stocks, they can play a stabilizing role in almost any portfolio. So treasury bonds are long debt obligations of the U.S. government with maturities ranging from 10 to 30 years. The interest earned on these bonds is exempt from state and local taxes, and treasury bonds are guaranteed by the U.S. government as to be timely payment of principal and interest. You look at municipal bonds, their debt obligations issued by the state, county, parish, or local government, or by some other municipal authority, like a public-owned water district, for example. So municipal bonds are typically issued to obtain funds to build and repair public works, projects. The interest on municipal bonds is generally exempt from federal income tax. If you purchase municipal bonds of a state or a city in which you live in, the interest may be actually exempt from state or local income taxes. And some municipal bond interest could be subject to that federal alternative minimum tax. And if you sell municipal bond for a profit, you could incur a capital gains tax. Now let's go to corporate bonds. They're much more a source of corporate borrowing. Debentures or unsecured bonds are backed by the general credit of the corporation. Asset-backed or secured bonds are backed by uh, specific corporate assets such as property or equipment. And these bonds generally have a higher yield than government bonds, but the income they produce is fully taxable. Until you become familiar with bonds, bond investing actually can be tricky. So let's go over some of the nuances in greater detail. Most bonds are sold at par or face value, which is the price which the bond is issued. And they pay interest to the bondholder on a regular basis. When a bond matures, the borrower repays the bondholder principal in full. However, you can sell a bond on an open market before it comes due because bonds value will rise or fall in response to changes in interest rates. If you sell your bond before it reaches maturity, you may end up receiving more or less of the original face value of the bond depending on interest rates at the time. So when interest rates rise, the market value of the existing bond falls. And here's why. Let's assume you want a bond investment to earn $1,000 over the next 12 months. If bonds are currently paying 6%, you would need to invest 16,666 to earn that amount. If bonds were paying 8%, you would need to invest only 12,500 to earn the same amount. That's pretty straightforward, right? So consider this thought. Let's assume you invested 16,666 in bonds paying 6%, and the prevalent interest rate then rose to 8%. If you were to sell your bond portfolio before your bond mature, how much would you get? That's right, 12,500. Do you see the problem? One way to address fluctuating interest rates is to stagger the maturity dates of the bonds in your portfolio. This strategy is called bond ladder, and it may help limit exposure to low interest rates while also increasing the likelihood that at least some of the principal may be available to reinvest when rates are rising. So you can create a bond ladder over a period of time by purchasing bonds of the same maturity every year or two. Alternatively, you could create a ladder during the same time period by purchasing new issue bonds of different maturities or by purchasing bonds on the secondary market that are scheduled to mature in a different years. 
For the latter strategy, you might purchase 10-year bond scheduled to mature in 2022, 2024, 2026, 2028, and 2030. Of the major investment categories, cash alternatives tend to be the safest, which means that there's little fluctuation in their value. However, if you're locked into low-yielding cash alternatives, such as a saving account, a CD, or a money market fund, you'll be subject to interest rate fluctuations, and your investment may not outpace inflation. And that's a key point. So savings accounts usually offer a higher level of security, but relatively low rate of return. They don't require large initial investment, and the funds in them are readily accessible. For many people, their main attraction is convenience and liquidity. Now, CDs are really just a short-term loan to a bank, credit union, or a savings association. They typically offer a moderate rate of return and relative safety. CDs usually require larger initial investment than savings accounts, and you must leave your principal for a term in order to avoid early withdrawal penalties. Now, money market accounts funds invest in a diverse portfolio of a short-term financial vehicles. The main goal is preservation of principal accompanied by modest dividend. Money market funds are very liquid and considered to have low risk. But remember, they're not insured by the FDIC. Now, in a low-interest environment, the value of low-yielding investment may be eroded by taxes and inflation. So when determining how much of your portfolio to devote to cash alternatives or to any other type of investment, keep in mind that taxes and inflation can take a toll on your returns. Let's look at that example. If you invested $20,000 in an account earning a hypothetical 3% rate of return, it would earn $600 after one year. For someone in the 32% federal income tax bracket, this amount earned after taxes would be 408. So the after-tax value of the account would be 20,408. After a 3% hypothetical rate of inflation is applied to the balance, the real rate of return on the investment is negative 0.93%. In this case, your investment would actually have lost money. Of course, remember that this is an example and it's hypothetical and just used for illustrative purposes only. Now, selecting individual investments can be a complex process that requires specialized knowledge, time, and attention. That is why many people invest in mutual funds and exchange traded funds, ETFs, so they could add a mix of stocks, bonds, and cash to their portfolios. Mutual funds and ETFs are portfolios of securities assembled by an investment company. Their underlying investments are typically selected to track a particular market index, asset class, or sector or they may just follow a specific strategy. Because these funds can hold dozens or hundreds of securities, they could provide greater diversification at a lower cost than you might obtain by investing in individual stocks and bonds, of course. Now, here's a list of the different type of mutual funds, ranging from lower to higher risk that cater to different groups of investors and their common goal. Money market funds, they invest in short-term debt investments such as commercial paper, CDs, treasury bills, money market funds, they're neither insured or guaranteed by the FDIC or any other government agency. Although money market funds attempt to maintain a stable $1 share price, you still can lose money investing in such a fund. Now let's talk about municipal bond funds. Generally offer income that is free of federal income tax and income may be free of state income tax if the bonds in the fund were issued from your state. Remember, Although interest income from municipal bond funds and some money market funds may be tax exempt, any capital gains are subject to tax. Also, income for the same investors may be subject to state and local taxes and federal alternative minimum tax. Now, let's talk about income funds. They concentrate their portfolios on bonds, treasury securities, and other income-oriented securities. And they may also include stocks that have history of paying high dividend. Bond funds are usually subject to the interest rate inflation, and credit risk associated with the underlying bonds in the fund. As interest rates rise, bond prices typically fall, which can adversely affect a bond fund performance. Predictably, balanced funds and growth and income funds seek the middle ground between growth fund and income fund. They include a mix of stocks and bonds and seek to combine moderate growth potential with modest income. Now, let's talk about growth funds. They invest in stocks of companies with high potential for appreciation but low, very low income. They're more volatile than many types of funds out there. Let's talk about international funds. 
They invest in foreign stocks and bond markets, sometimes in specific countries. Global funds invest in combination of domestic and foreign securities. There are increased risk associated with international investing, as you know, including differences in financial reporting, currency exchanges risk, economic and political risk, which are unique to specific countries that you're investing in, and also have a greater share of price volatility. Now let's talk about sector funds. Sector funds invest almost exclusively in a particular industry or sector of the economy. Although they offer greater appreciation potential, the risk level is also higher. So investments seeking to achieve higher rate of return also carry an increased level of risk. So if changes in the market prompt you to sell some investments for more or less than your adjusted tax basis in the asset, it may result in capital gains or capital loss. Hopefully, your reason for selling are consistent with your overall investment strategy and not emotional reaction to short-term market swings. Otherwise, you might be selling when prices are falling and buying when prices are rising, which is the opposite tack from the recommended buy low, sell high strategy. So short-term capital gain, which is profit on investments held for 12 months or less, are taxes ordinary income. So if you're in a 24% tax bracket, you will pay 24%. Long-term capital gains, profits realized from the sale of an investment that were held for more than 12 months, receive a special tax treatment. The top long-term capital gains tax rate right now is 20% for high-income investors, but most investors pay 15% on long-term capital gains. If your capital losses exceed your capital gains for the year, the excess can be deducted on your tax return and used to reduce other income, such as wages, up to an annual limit of $3,000 of ordinary income per year, or $1,500 if you are married filing separately. And if your total net capital loss is more than the annual limit on capital loss deductions, you can actually carry over the use portion to the next year and treat it as if it incurred in that year. So here's a hypothetical example. Sam had $4,000 capital gain last year, but his capital losses totaled $10,000. He can apply $4,000 of the losses to offset all of the capital gains, and he can also apply $3,000 of the losses against his ordinary income. The remaining $3,000 losses could be carried forward to the next year to, for him to use. If you sell a security at a loss and repurchase a substantially identical security within 30 days before or after of the sale, the IRS will disallow the loss for tax purposes. This is referred to as wash sale rule. As I mentioned, the tax code treats long-term capital gains more favorably than ordinary income, such as wages or interest from bonds and savings accounts. Qualified dividends, which is profits paid to shareholders from domestic corporations or qualified foreign corporations, receive the same tax treatment as long-term capital gains. Non-qualified dividends are taxed as ordinary income, just like short-term capital gains, which are profits on investment held for 12 months or less. So for in order for you to make sound investing decision, it's important to understand how your investments will be taxed. In 2021, long-term capital gains and qualified dividends are taxed at 15% for the single filers whose taxable incomes range from 40,401 up to 445,850. And for married joint filers whose taxable income ranges from 80,801 up to 501,600, Lower income filers pay zero tax on long-term capital gains and dividends. Higher income filers, by the way, which are single filers with taxable income exceeding 445,850, and married joint filers with taxable income exceeding 501,600, pay 20%. Generally, dividends on stocks that are held for at least 61 days within a specified 120-day period are considered qualified for tax purposes. Distributions from mutual funds held in taxable accounts are also taxable to shareholders. By the way, the taxable is long-term and or short-term capital gains, dividends, or interest for the year in which they were received, even if the distribution is reinvested in new shares. In addition, some high-income taxpayers may be subject to 3.8% unearned income tax or net investment income. Capital gain dividend interest, royalties, rents, and passive income, if their modified adjusted gross income, AGI, exceeds the $200,000 threshold for a single filer and the $200,000 threshold for joint filers, the 3.8% rule net investment income tax applies to the lesser of A, net investment income, or B, AGI exceeding the threshold. It does not apply to withdrawals from IRAs and qualified retirement plans, nor does it apply to municipal bond interest. 
The money you contribute to tax deferred plans, as well as any earnings, will accumulate tax deferred. When you buy or sell investments within your plan, there are typically no tax implications, by the way, subject to plan rules. You won't owe any income tax until you withdraw money from the account, at which time you will be taxed as an ordinary income. Generally, it's not a good idea to take advantage of tax deferred saving plans whenever possible. Up to specific annual limit, you can make pre-tax contribution to an employer-sponsored retirement plan and or make tax deduction contribution to a traditional IRA, which could lower your taxable income in a given year. Tax deferral has the potential to boost your earning potential because you have full contribution working for you. To illustrate, take a look at the hypothetical example. The chart here shows potential growth in account value at 5,000 annual investment in taxable and tax deferred vehicle earning a hypothetical 6% rate of return. After 40 years, the money placed in the taxable account will be worth 567680 During the same period, the tax deferred account would grow to 82238 That's significantly more than the taxable investment. Even after taxes have been deducted, assuming lump sum payout and 24% tax rate, you would still receive 623381 you also might consider whether an annuity could play a role in your retirement investment strategy. You see, purchasing an annuity could help boost your income and reduce your risk of depleting your savings in retirement. And knowing that some of your retirement income is protected might enable you to invest a portion of your portfolio more aggressively. See, an annuity is a contract between you and insurance company in return for premium payments you make during the annuity accumulation phase. The company pays you regular income during the payout or in annuitization phase, usually during retirement. Immediate annuities pay income right away while deferred annuities start paying at some future date. Annuities also offer tax benefits. Investment earnings are basically tax deferred until withdrawals are received. But unlike the caps placed on the IRAs and employer-sponsored plans, there is no federal contribution limit for annuities. This means that you can suck as many after-tax dollars as you want over time or on an annuity with a lump sum from inheritance or the sale of a home or a business. When you retire, payouts can be structured to provide you with an income stream that is guaranteed to last throughout your lifetime and or the lifetime of your spouse much like a pension. This may help alleviate any fears of outliving your savings once a contract annuitized and those guaranteed payments kick in. However, control of the assets transfers to the insurance company. For this reason, some annuity owners never annuitize their accounts, choosing to take withdrawals as needed instead. This will allow any remaining asset in a deferred annuity to be left to the heirs upon death. Now that we've discussed a few of the most common types of investment, let's look at some of the fundamental investment tactics that could enhance your potential for financial success in any market environment. Three fundamental investment tactics are suggested to help you manage risk, smooth out investment returns, and improve the potential performance of your portfolio over the long run. Although these strategies may seem unexciting, much of their value comes in from reducing the potential to react emotionally during periods of market volatility. They are diversification, asset allocation, and dollar cost averaging are the methods used to help manage investment risk. Keep in mind, they do not guarantee a profit or protection against investment loss. Let's start with diversification. It involves investing in different investment vehicles in an attempt to limit exposure to losses in any one sector of the market. Different types of investments may react to changing market conditions in different ways. For example, an unfavorable news story may push stock prices lower while bond values rise, or vice versa. When you divide your money among various asset classes and investment vehicles, gains in one area can help compensate for the losses in another, and thereby limiting your risk of loss. And although any level of diversification can help protect a portfolio, it can be hard to determine which type of investments are most likely to react differently when market volatility occurs. That's when a financial professional may be of help to suggest a mix of investment opportunities for you that can perhaps enhance the benefit of diversification. Of course, there are no assurances that working with a financial professional will improve investment performance. And diversification is a method used to help manage investment risk. It does not guarantee profit or protect against investment loss. So keep that in mind. Now, because stocks tend to be more volatile than other investments, here are some possible ways 
to diversify the equity portion of your portfolio, whether you're investing in individual stocks, individual funds, or exchange trading funds. You could, for example, divide your equities among large cap growth and value stocks, small cap growth and value stocks, dividend yielding securities, international investments, low volatility funds, even among different industry sectors. Market capitalization is a measure of the company's size and value. Large caps tend to be more stable and thus have less growth potential, while small caps tend to be more volatile in terms of growth potential and risk. The terms growth and value reflect different investing styles. Growth companies typically do not pay dividends and are more likely to reinvest their profits. Investors hope to benefit from future appreciation. Value stocks may be priced lower relative to their earnings assets or growth potential. Good stocks and value stocks and large cap and small cap stocks may all respond differently for different market conditions. Dividend yielding securities provide income that can be reinvested or used to supplement other income, making them attractive to conservative investors. The total return from dividend stocks comes from the dividend reinvested plus any price appreciation. Now, a Standard & Poor study found that dividends have represented one-third of the monthly total return for the S&P 500 index since 1926. Dividends are also fairly stable over time. And during periods of volatility, dividend income can provide some protection when prices are falling. Now, international stocks may perform differently than domestic stocks, creating the potential for growth at times when the U.S. market is declining. Of course, investing internationally carries additional risks, such as difference in financial reporting, currency exchange risk, as well as economic and political risk unique to the specific country. Any of these factors could create greater share price volatility, and you might consider investing a portion of your equities in low-volatility stock funds and ETFs in an attempt to capture reasonable returns with less risk. And although low volatility funds may provide downside risk protection, they might not provide as much upside performance potential in certain market conditions. Remember, diversification is not a guarantee of a profit or to protect against loss. It is a method you could use to help manage risk and the return and principal value of stocks and mutual funds and ETFs fluctuate with market conditions. Keep in mind, asset allocation involves strategically dividing a portfolio into different asset categories, typically stocks, bonds, and cash alternatives. You do that to seek the highest potential return at a particular level of risk. History has shown that the best performing asset classes often change from year to year. Stocks may generate the highest returns in some years, whereas bonds may outperform stocks in others. So during bear market, cash alternatives may be higher performers. In and of itself, asset allocation is easy. In fact, whether you know it or not, your assets have been allocated, perhaps in a single stock, in savings account, in a mixed portfolio, or under the mattress. However, finding an appropriate mix of investments for your risk profile, financial needs, and time frame is more difficult. It may require careful calculation and the benefit of professional guidance. If you want to personalize your asset allocation, you need to take into account your investment objectives. Whether you're concerned about protecting the value of your portfolio, looking for growth potential, or generating steady income, your time frame and your risk tolerance, asset allocation does not guarantee a profit to protect against investment loss. It is just a method used to help manage investment risk by itself. Investments seeking the potential for higher return carry an increased level of risk. If you receive a statement from a mutual fund company or a 401k plan, you may see breakdown of how your fund assets are allocated in the form of a pie chart. This pie chart you see shows a hypothetical allocation for a conservative investor. This investor's primary concern is to minimize the upward and the downward swings in the portfolio. He basically desires an appropriate mix of investment categories for such a time frame. He might have 50% in his portfolio in bonds, 30% in stocks, and 20% in cash alternatives. These investment categories would be somewhat volatile over the years. But because he has a fairly long time frame, this mix of investments could give him an adequate potential return for the risk he's willing to take. How did this conservatively allocated portfolio perform over the 20-year period from 2001 to 2020? Well, during the best year, his portfolio would have earned 18.79%. During the worst year, it would have lost 11.98%. The average annual return was 8%. Now, an aggressive investor is willing to take 
more risk and accept more volatility in exchange for higher growth potential. She has the same 20-year time frame as a conservative investor, but her investment allocation looks different. An appropriate investment mix for an aggressive investor might be only 5% in cash and alternatives, 20% in bonds, and 75% in growth-oriented stocks. So here is how the aggressively allocated portfolio would have performed over the same 20-year period. That is 2001 through 2020. During the best year, it would have performed 27.8%. During the worst year, it would have lost 27.4%. The average annual return was 7.05%, slightly higher than the conservative portfolio. Because aggressive investments are typically more volatile, they have the potential to produce higher highs and lower lows than counterparts with the company in risk. However, investors who are willing to wade through the market ups and downs also may achieve higher average returns over time. The third investment strategy I want to discuss with you is dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging involves investing in set amounts of money at regular intervals, such as on a monthly basis. By investing the same amount consistently over time, you're able to buy more shares of an investment when the price is low and fewer shares when the price is high, which may result in lower average cost per share, regardless of whether the market is going up or down. If you're contributing a percentage of your salary to an employer-sponsored retirement plan, you're practicing dollar cost averaging. In this hypothetical example, an investor uses dollar cost averaging to invest $200 per month in a mutual fund with fluctuating share prices. At the end of five months, she has purchased 215 shares. As you could see, the average price per share during the five-month period was $5.20. But because she purchased more shares when the price were low, her average costs were 4.65 per share. So dollar cost averaging can help you take advantage of the stock market fluctuations without the stress and risk of trying to time the market. It is also a good way to steadily accumulate shares to help meet your long-term goals. Although a dollar cost averaging can be a useful strategy, it does not ensure a profit or prevent loss. To take full advantage of the benefits of the strategy, you must financially be able to continue making purchases through periods of high and low price level. So now that we've discussed investment vehicles and portfolio strategies at some length, Let's look at some few other considerations that might help you put this information together. What can we learn from historical investment performance? A lot? Nothing? More than you want to know? Although past performance does not indeed tell us nothing about what will happen in the future and not a guarantee of future results, it can be instructive to see how different types of investments are performed over time and in different economic conditions and investment climates when making investment decisions. This graph shows the volatility of stocks, corporate bonds, and treasury bills from 1996 through 2020. As you can see, stocks are much more volatile. That is why most experts suggest investing in them only when you have at least 5 to 10 years before you need the money you invest. On a historical basis, corporate bonds have not performed as well as stocks over time but they're typically less volatile on the other hand. Treasury bills and other cash alternatives almost always produce positive returns, but their potential for growth and keeping pace with inflation is much lower. If you're investing in short-term goals, such as college or the purchase of a home, you may want to keep some of your assets in lower risk and less volatile investments so you can help protect your principal for that particular goal. It is also important to consider the unpredictability of the financial markets over different time periods. Look at these cumulative returns of the S&P 500 composite stock index over three different five-year periods, 1996 to 2000, 2006 to 2010, and 2016 to 2020. As you can see, these three five-year periods produce vastly different results. Investing in stocks over short time periods could result in loss and even negative cumulative return. This occurred during the five-year period from 2004 through 2008, when the cumulative return of the S&P 500 was 10.47%. So stocks are risky, right? But what could happen to your portfolio if you decide to take time off from investing in the stock market? Trying to time the market by moving in and out of stocks, bonds, and cash alternatives is usually a losing game and generally lowers your investment performance. During the period from 1991 through 2020, The average annual return of stocks was 10.7%. 
if you had held a stock portfolio that mirrored the S&P 500 for all 360 months, during that 30-year period, you could have earned a 10.7% average annual return. If instead, you had tried to time the market, and as a result, missed the 12 best trading months, your average annual return for that 30-year period would have been reduced to 7.23%. And the more good trading days you missed, the lower your return would have been. Adjusting your portfolio to capitalize on long-term trends can be beneficial. Also, missing the worst trading days would improve your overall return. But in the long run, consistently predicting the best times to buy and sell is impossible. It's very unlikely you would have picked those 12 great months at the time they occurred. A consistent long-term strategy may be more effective at helping you reduce risk and achieving your financial objective. In spite of our good intentions, some common behavioral tendencies can stand in the way of making sound investment decisions, especially when markets are volatile. Behavioral scientists, by the way, have identified cognitive biases that may cause us to ignore fundamental and critical factors and possibly focus on other information that may not be as important. Clearly, normal emotions can drive hasty decisions that could harm the long-term performance of your portfolio. So here's just a few examples of behavior you might want to understand and avoid. Confirmation bias. People have a natural tendency to come to conclusion and then gather data to validate that decision rather than first evaluating data before coming to a conclusion. So one way to overcome confirmation bias is to seek outside counsel from someone who can provide a different and unbiased perspective. The other one is chasing performance. Some investors may be tempted to move a lot of money into asset classes or individual investments that have had the highest recent returns. The problem with this approach is that the past performance doesn't guarantee future results, and today's hot pick could turn into a loser when conditions shift. Another one is reacting to headline news. By the time the average investor learns about economic developments or other events that could affect individual investments and the financial markets, it is usually too late to let to respond effectively. In fact, it's very likely that the news is already reflected in the prices of securities and following the pack may not actually be the wisest choice you can take. In fact, following someone else's lead instead of using your own judgment could land you in trouble. Another one is loss aversion and panic selling. When investors pull out of investments or the market because they're afraid of losing money, as opposed to evaluating company fundamentals, they often end up selling at the worst possible time and buying again at the highest prices, when that is after the market recovers. By selling low, of course, they could lock in their losses and it may cost more to get back into the market in that particular case. So managing your emotions and expectations can be difficult in any market situation. But focusing too much on short-term gains or losses is generally unwise. And abandoning sound investment strategy in the heat of the moment could be detrimental to the long-term performance of your portfolio. Do you find yourself chasing winners? Or are you value investor seeking bargain? Do you often take large investment risk for a quick gain? Or do you generally leave your investment alone for the most part? Legendary investment, by the way, Benjamin Graham, considered father of the value investing, once said the individual investor should act consistently as an investor and not as a speculator. These are words of wisdom. Capture fundamental concepts that might help you establish and maintain a sound financial strategy. Paul Samuelson, who won the 1970 Nobel Prize in Economic Science, described a patient investing approach in humorous terms. Investing should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. Speculators typically take large risks by trying to anticipate future price movements in the hopes of making quick gains. The danger of this approach is that few people have the expertise, time, and resources to do that successfully. It's more likely that by trying to time the market, you will sell at the bottom and buy at the top. They might miss some of the best trading days and their portfolios will likely underperform. Smart investors take risks too, but they buy assets that appear to be sound investments and build them into a balanced portfolio that is appropriate for their goal, time frame, and risk tolerance. In other words, they generally maintain a buy and hold strategy and invest for the long term. When it comes to your personal finances and your investment portfolio, are you where you want to be? Are you confident that you have positioned yourself to potentially benefit from changes in the economy 
and the financial markets. Today's presentation is intended to be the first step in the process of helping you become smarter about your money and investments. Continuing your financial knowledge will further help you make important decisions to make the most out of your money and investment. But some people may think they lack the knowledge, discipline, motivation, or time to stay on top of their finances and the markets year in, year out. One strategy is to work with the right financial professional. Why consider working with the right one versus anyone? It's not to get rich quick. In fact, there's no assurances that working with any professional will result in your reaching your financial goals or achieving superior investment results. Professionals don't have a magic wand. However, the right one can provide education and make suggestions that you might find helpful when developing a game plan and weighing specific financial opportunities. By helping you balance your goals with market conditions, Confidence Wealth can help you determine which strategies may be appropriate for you based on your financial situation, appetite for risk, and time frame. A financial reality check might prepare you for changing market conditions. Confidence Wealth can also serve as a knowledgeable sounding board and provide you with objective viewpoint as you weigh investment opportunities and pursue your long-term objectives. We covered a lot of information today. I believe that the material we shared will help you feel more confident when you're making decisions about your financial future. So how can you put all that knowledge to work? There are several ways to proceed. You can do it yourself, which could be tremendous amount of work, or you can work with confidence wealth. You can also procrastinate, that's easy, but given the long-term ramifications of the decisions you must make, procrastination is not a prudent move. So I hope you enjoyed our webinar. Surviving Market Swings. As you can see, investment planning is just one piece of the comprehensive financial plan, and all components are interwined. They all affect each other. It may be a while since we've met. If you haven't scheduled anything, take advantage of that office hour. Let's see if your investments, among other financial planning needs, can be addressed and looked into to create a roadmap for you. We will go again and look at your tax planning, investment planning, estate planning, your generational planning, your legacy planning. There are a number of issues you probably haven't been thinking about. Or if we talk to you about it, you probably weren't considering, but you're considering now. All these things can be addressed when you are at this office hour and see if there's something that can help you achieve a better future.